Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. We come now to another one of our Atenlay segments wherein uh, we look at some Latin phrases connected to uh, the history and study of theology and the Word of God. Uh, Last time we covered one of these, we looked at uh, Fabricum Idolarum, which is a uh, Latin phrase coined by John Calvin. And today I'd like to speak about one coined by St. Augustine. It was St. Augustine who said, Credo ut intelligam. Credo ut intelligam. And oh, by the way, in case anybody doesn't know this, uh, there's a great deal of mystery and uncertainty about how Latin is to be uh, pronounced when it is spoken. So uh, if you go and quote me and mispronounce, although again, I'd have a hard time knowing how anyone would know you were, uh, but if someone says you've mispronounced, uh, well, don't blame me because I'm telling you, I don't know how to pronounce these things. I do know how they're spelled. Credo ut intelligam is C as in Charlie, R E as an echo, D as in dog, O, credo, that's uh, uh, the first word. The new word, the second word is ut, U as in uh, ut, <laughs> U as in unconditional election, uh, T, T as in Tom, credo, ut, and then the third word is intelligam, I N T. E-L-L-I-G-A-M, credo ut intelligam, which means I believe in order that I might understand. Credo is I believe. That's where we get our word creeds from, like the Apostles' Creed. Credo is the first person present singular of the Latin. I believe it would be creed. I better not try to uh, (laughs) break that down into all its parts. Uh, Credo, I believe, but in order to, intelligam, like the word intelligence, uh, to understand. I believe in order that I might understand. What Augustine meant by that is actually uh, open to some level of debate. There are those who would take that expression as a uh, clear and passionate embracing of what we might call fideism, which is uh, both an ism and a Latin phrase. Fideism means literally faithism, and it's the idea that uh, we should have no expectation that anything in our faith should be uh, rational or coherent, and in fact trying to prove or uh, sort of uh, systematize our convictions is somehow unspiritual and that uh, we just take a leap of faith and we believe. Uh, and so the the argument is that Augustine is siding with that perspective and saying, look, I don't, I don't know how to understand all this stuff. All I know is I believe it. And that's the only way I can understand. And I don't try to, to get everything to fit or, as they say, put it in a box with a pretty bow around it. I don't believe at all that that's what Augustine is saying, that if one were to read the corpus of Augustine's writings, one would find a man very committed to rationality and coherence in his understanding. So I think what he's trying to say is something a little bit more subtle than that raw, fideistic interpretation. Uh, Here's what I think he's saying. I think what he's saying is, is that, as Jesus said, unless we're born again, we can't see the kingdom of God. That apart from the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, we don't have the capacity to understand spiritual things. So we have to believe first. We have to believe in the sense of coming to saving faith by the power of the Holy Spirit so that from there we are able to get past uh, our fallen 
uh, minds, our fallen nature, so that we can actually understand some things, not everything. Uh, regeneration does not make us uh, omniscient. Uh, it doesn't even make us inerrant or infallible. What it does do is give us the possibility, by the power of the Spirit, of understanding what God has chosen to reveal about himself and about our relationship with him. So credo ut intelligam, I believe in order to understand, is perfectly uh, reasonable and actually quite valuable because it reminds us that our saving faith or even our understanding is not ultimately something that we attained to. Are we supposed to study God's word? Of course. Are we supposed to equip our minds with uh, the capacity to think in rational coherence? Of course we are. But we've been given sight. We've been given eyes that can see and discern that which is spiritual in its nature, truths that are spiritual. Doesn't mean we're embracing contradictions. By no means. We're still talking, after all, about understanding. And there's nothing you can do to understand a contradiction because they're not understandable because they're not real. They're not true. They're not possible. So let's acknowledge that our minds, apart from the regenerating work of the Spirit, are darkened. And that as we are reborn, we're now able to not only see the light, but see by the light. And seeing by the light, we're able to understand more fully. Now, here's how I want to finish. It's about how we finish. Because when we die, friends, we will be completely sanctified. Every bit of darkness that clouds our thinking will be gone. And we will understand ever so much more, and we will rejoice over it. It's summertime, and the giving is wheezy. <laughs> I don't know. Wheezy may not be the best word to describe it, but it is. Uh, it does rhyme with easy. And so there it was. It is summertime, and for most ministries, summertime is a difficult time, whether that ministry is a, a parachurch ministry or a, a local church. Uh, it seems that uh, worship, at least in the local church, uh, finds itself competing with baseball and picnics and camping and other such things, such that many churches find themselves uh, with a radically lower attendance during the summer months, which leads to lower giving. For parachurch ministries, I'm not exactly sure why summer months make such a difference, but it seems that they do. And Dunamis Fellowship is no exception. Uh, I would say that uh, in our brief history, we have experienced downtimes during the summertime. Um, and so in today's uh, segment, um, which I seek to uh, find ministry partners, I just wanted to remind you that we're still here, we're still working, we're still uh, seeking to serve the church. You know, not too long ago, I got to uh, do a uh, whole program with my precious wife, Lisa, talking about our, or as a part of our 500th episode of the Jesus Changes Everything podcast. It was a lot of uh, fun, that conversation, and a great uh, joy to look back over those 500 episodes and give thanks for all that we've been able to accomplish. But I confess during that segment that one of the hardest things, one of the most difficult challenges is a uh, relative uh, lack of feedback. And one of the ways that feedback is measured is financially. Are we hitting the mark? Are we serving? Now, once again, let me say with great clarity that I am not, if, if any of you are going to stop listening because uh, you feel bad that you're not in a position to give, then please do not stop listening. That's what we're here for. We're not here to raise money. 
we're here to help to teach, uh, to be a podcast that helps people come to understand that Jesus changes everything. So please don't go away because once a week I come in here and say, hey, can you support this work? Now, there are others of you, I trust, who uh, are in a position to support this work, and you're the ones I'm asking, would you do so? Would you encourage us in that way by letting us know that you value what we're doing? Uh, it was interesting. I think it was during that 500th uh, episode show that my precious wife made a very good point in which she said that when you're doing God's work, uh, the bills go to him. And uh, that's very much how I feel about what it is we're doing. I can tell you this, too, that in my history of uh, working with parachurch organizations, uh, it's tough to keep everybody happy. That is, when you charge people for what it is you're providing, people tend to object that, hey, um, this is... God's word. This is God, the teaching of God's word. How in the world can you charge money for that? And yet when you don't charge money for that and instead seek to raise support by asking for donors to come alongside, you get the complaint, you're always asking for money. Well, here's the thing. Nobody likes having to give money. Nobody likes not having money. Uh, but the truth of the matter is it costs money to do ministry. My father used to say, you know how much it costs to do a million dollars worth of ministry? A million dollars. He's right. We certainly all try to be effective and efficient. One of the things also I mentioned in that 50th anniversary or 50th episode celebration was this glorious truth that our marginal cost, that is the additional cost for each additional listener are zero. It doesn't cost any more for us to be creating a podcast that's listened to by 10,000 people than it does to create a podcast that's listened to by 10 people. It does take greater work from all of you. So again, here's what I'm asking of you as I will next week and the week after that. I'm asking that you would come alongside, that you would pray for what we're doing, that you would at least value what we're doing in a in a way that you can bring us before the throne of God and say to God, Lord, look, I'm I'm not uh, in a position to be able to give, but I'm being blessed by this ministry, and so Lord, I'm asking you to bless them. Would you pray that way? Would you, if you are in a position to give, give? We can one time gifts are always accepted. Monthly gifts are particularly valuable to us because they help us to be able to plan and know what's coming. So can you consider joining with us? Once again, the process is abundantly simple. rcsproljr.com. That's my website. I post the podcast there every day. I post blog pieces there every day. rcsproljr.com, but also on the homepage, there's a button where you can donate. Just click the button, follow the instructions, and you're done. That's what we're asking for, friends. Now, let's get back to talking about Jesus Changes Everything. In Luke 13, beginning in verse 6, we read these words. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. This particular parable is given right after one of the uh, most important uh, conversations that Jesus had with the people around him with respect to the issue of God's judgment. That is, earlier in the chapter, well, let's go ahead and start in verse 1, read through uh, 
through verse 5. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. It's important to remember that context, that Luke is not putting these things together by accident, nor is Jesus. Jesus is rebuking uh, those who are taking the position that, well, these people who died in these horrific accidents uh, must have been really terrible, terrible people, and that's why they died. They're embracing the ideology of the friends of Job. Now, as I'm recording today, people are still being dug out of the condominium that collapsed recently in South Florida. At present time, there are four known dead, but 159 are missing. Well, this is what these events were like. These were well-known events where people suffered and died in unexpected ways. And Jesus' message is not, you know, if you want to understand why this happened, you need to look at the victims. Rather, his message is, this should not surprise any of you. What you really need to do is look at yourself. Because the truth of the matter is, we're all guilty and judgment is coming. This is, I suspect, a pretty clear allusion to what's coming in 70 A.D., and so the parable is the same thing. I would suggest, uh, and this is a historically common view, that uh, if we want to assign roles, so to speak, that the owner of the vineyard represents the father, that the keeper of the vineyard represents Jesus, and the fig tree itself represents both uh, the nation of Israel and the individual. Notice that Jesus said that this uh, uh, keeper of the vineyard says that he's been working on this, or actually it was the owner who said it's been three years and there's been no fruit. Well, at about this time, between the ministry of John the Baptist and Jesus, there has been about three years that have passed. And Jesus is hoping for, asking for, demonstrating that there's still some time left, but that destruction is, in fact, coming. You need to repent or you will all likewise perish. There is this little bit of time, and that little bit of time is there because I'm here and I'm trying through the preaching and the ministry that I'm performing, the miracles that I'm performing, I'm trying to sort of coax out of this tree some fruit. I'm fertilizing it. I'm taking care of it. I'm digging a trench around it. All of this is what's coming out of my ministry so that you might repent and escape this very same judgment. One of the things I love about this text is it really flies in the face uh, of that broad, cultural, sloppy, Jesus is such a sweet guy kind of perspective. Because Jesus is here reminding his audience of the reality of judgment. Judgment that's already happened in the case of these two examples that he uses and judgment which was to come in 70 A.D., and this is still true for all of us. We may have spent our whole lives studying the things of God. We may have been under faithful biblical preaching. We may have had this going on or that going on. Uh, maybe you're uh, a young uh, man or woman who grew up in the church and now you're struggling with, well, is this about me or is this about my parents? And Jesus has a message for you. You need to repent. And, geez, and it, you, you may be a believer, and I, if you are a believer, I want you, along with me and every other believer, to understand this message also. We are owed judgment from God. We are owed destruction by God. And because of Jesus, we have escaped that destruction. 
which means our calling is to rejoice and to celebrate and to call others to that same repentance, not to grumble and complain. Well, that's the parable of the fig tree, and I pray that it would be useful in God's kingdom for bringing forth from all of us greater abundance of fruit. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.